Bricks. Yeah. All right. Hello. Hello. Welcome to lecture three. Yes. Um, today. Before we start today, actually, a couple announcements. Um, assignment two, due on Thursday. I mean, next week. Um, we have a work session Sunday, not Saturday. Got moved. And um, GBs. Um, if you guys are interested, sign up for a GB, which is a fun character building experience. Um, yeah. Anyways. And who is teaching them how to build characters? I'll be one of them. Definitely testing your character. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. Um, today, we're going to be talking about mixers and filters. That's right. So yeah. let's get to it. Uh, first, we're going to start with mixers. So the first question to ask is, obviously, what is a mixer? Um, basically, what it does is that, first of all, it has a symbol like this. Um, we show it with RF, LO, and then IF. So what it does is that we feed one signal to it, and then another signal, and then we receive an output, which is going to be the multiplication of these two signals. Um, that's an overview of what a mixer is. Now, Nathan is going to go through a little bit of math. Hopefully, you guys reviewed your EE102, um, because it involves some of that as well. Yeah. And so, in this project, we're going to be building what's called a mixer. And it's going to be mixing two signals in the time domain. Um, so we're feeding in what our signal is going to be, uh, the signal we want to, our, our signal of interest. Another one's going to be um, our oscillator. And what it's going to do is we want to take our original frequency, our original signal and step it up in frequency. Because ultimately we want to step it up to 27 megahertz while our microcontroller starts at 1 megahertz. So we want to go from 1 to 27. And the way to do that is through a mixer. So the first thing you might ask is, how do we step up things in frequency when we're multiplying it in time? Great question. Uh, well, if you guys remember from 102, if you were to multiply signals in the time domain, it causes a convolution in the frequency domain, and vice versa. So we're gonna take advantage of the convolution property and try and step up our frequency. So, just to review a little bit of 102, let's say we have two signals. We'll have a cosine um, of omega 1t and cosine of omega 2t. <coughs> right. right. So, these are two cosine functions, both with frequencies omega 1 and omega 2. And when we multiply these together, it's going to create cosine omega 1 t times cosine omega 2 t. And if you remember your trigonometric identities, uh, this cosine omega 1 t times cos omega 2 t equals um, 1 half cos of omega 1 plus omega 2 t uh, plus cos of omega 1 minus omega 2 t. So already, I think we can begin to see where this is heading. If we want to step up frequencies, we feed in some signal, cosine omega 1 t, and mix it with some other signal, perhaps cosine omega 2 t. And it's going to create two terms. And we get, basically, we get to add frequencies together and we get to um, subtract also. Um, and the way you can actually take this and isolate and just get one of those signals is by filtering. That one we're going to actually talk about more in depth later. Um, but this is just a high level example, but it's not actually what we'll be doing. Instead, um, we're going to be using a square wave to mix. And so, Actually, before I get to that, um, 
One way we can actually show this in the frequency domain is cosine has a frequency spectrum of plus or minus omega one. Um, and um, this other one also has omega two now as the frequency spectrum. And so a frequency way to look at this when we mix them together would be like this. same thing with that good version on this side. Uh, this kind of makes sense. Okay. Well, let's see. Um, can anyone tell what alteration just happened in the frequency domain that generated those two? Like convolution. That is right. Nice. Like if you flip and drag, you will see how those two peaks on the positive and the two peaks on the negative side are achieved. Yeah. Um, in general, so convolutions are very tedious and unintuitive. Um, and so in general, when you want to analyze things, you flip between the frequency and time domain um, to simplify your map. But this case is actually a good way in which you can look at understanding convolution to really take advantage of this. So we want to step up our frequency, which is look at this peak over here. Okay. So once, okay, so then our signal will not be quite as simple as this and this. So we could model actually our input frequency, our input signal, as cosine of two i, cosine of omega t plus some phase, um, and then we're going to generate somewhat a sine wave. I mean, a square wave. And so, does anybody know actually what the um, how to express a square wave in terms of Sines and cosines. Do you one and two? One and two and one. Well, I mean, so like you add it to the even things or something? Close, yeah, the odds. Yeah. The odds yeah. And so, yeah, you can express <coughs> any periodic signal as a sum of sines and cosines. So given we have a square wave, which is a periodic signal, we can express it as the sum of odd harmonics. So we'll say square wave, square is equal to, um, let's say four pi. Or pi summation of sine of like n t. So it looks like this, where n is odd. Damn, is that off the screen? No, is that off? Okay, cool. No, we're good. Chill. All right. And so now thinking of this, we know that convolutions and mixing is going to be a linear operation. We can take this entire expression and we can mix it with this cosine. And so if we put this together, we get a series of terms, which is going to be one half, um, so four over pi times the first one over n for the first term, sine of t times cos of omega one t dot dot plus one over one half times four over pi times one third sine of three t. I forgot something. This is n omega t. My bad. Omega t. 
bring the two plus dot 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 that goes on and using trig functions uh trig priorities <coughs> you can um simplify this similar to what we do over here where uh we do where it turns into basically um your frequency response equals um, or your actually time response. It's gonna be two over pi times the sine of your input signal um, plus the square wave frequency. difference of frequencies and then do this for each term plus dot 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 and so really we're getting in the broader scope we're getting um, a bunch of sine waves um, which we have the frequencies are going to be sums and differences of higher order frequencies so at first we're we're mixing WLOs is going to be omega one, or sorry, omega over here. But later on, for later terms, it's going to be three omega, then five omega. And at that point, we're getting a frequency distribution, which is very spread out, right? But we can narrow that down through something like a bandpass filter. So we can actually take this entire thing and filter it, and thereby stepping up our frequency. Any questions so far? Cool. Okay, so yes, um, as we said, n is a uh, is an odd integer, so you're gonna have omega 1 plus omega hello, and then the next term is gonna be omega 1 plus 3 omega hello, um, so if we were to draw the spectrum, you will have omega 1, and then you're convolving this basically with omega LO, 3 omega LO, and uh, 5 omega LO, and so on. So what you will get actually at the end will look something like this. And well, your desired frequency is probably this one, which is omega LO plus omega 1. And then you can then filter it, which we're going to explain later. OK. So we talked about how um, you multiply two signals in terms of mathematics, and how the resulting signal will have the sum of the two frequencies. But how do we actually implement this in hardware? So that's what we're going to talk about now. Is anyone still writing this? Now, this part is going to be, well, some more circuit theory, as we promised. Um, well, it turns out that one of the scariest things that you can ask an electrical engineer is to tell you what is the direction of the current in this setup. If I1 is this, what is I2 and what is B? Um, so let's call this one B. Right. Um, and well, the ratio can be n1 to n2. Okay, can, can anyone tell me what's going to be uh, the direction of i2 and the 
the polarization of V2. All right. People are sweating. That's good. I want to say it's going this way on the top side. Like like this. Yes. Okay. Probably wrong though. But any other ideas? I would say the other way. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, okay. So here is here is a trick to just know in general. You can think of these dots as tunnels. So if my current is going into this one, it's gonna go here and then come out. <laughs> Toby was right. Uh, all right, so at least we found the direction of the current. Now, if I connect this to a load, kind of like this, um, ZL, what should be the voltage here? Is this gonna be plus, this minus, or this minus, this plus, if I wanna have a current that's flowing in this direction? on the top, yeah. Acts like a, kind of like a battery. So this is gonna be your V2. Right? And the relationship between V1 and V2 is obviously N1 over N2, which is the, it depends on the number of coils, better to say the ratio, um, <coughs> the ratio of the turns. And I1 over I2 will be N2 over N1. All right, so please keep this in mind for the rest of your career. <laughs> so you won't be scared anymore. <laughs> All right, let's do another one. Um, I want going in. Okay, any volunteers? <laughs> What is the direction? Anyone? It's a tunnel. It's so a tunnel, yeah. So it goes out one end and then goes out the other one. Okay, so like how? So it goes in. It goes down. And then like this? Yeah. That's right. See? Very simple. Um, okay. If I2 is going this way, then that means like I2 started from here, so it's the same thing. Again, we connect it to a load. All right, what's gonna be the polarization? It's gonna be this. Be this. And the ratios are still the same. I2, I1 over I2. All right, now people can um, play tricks on you, say, oh, we define V2 as positive here, minus here, but that's just gonna be a negative sign here, so don't worry. Uh, any questions about this? Yes. Uh, what, what, why are the dots there in the first place? Oh, um, that's a good question. So this means how your transformer is set up. Let's say, so the, the way that a transformer looks like is this. You have a core, and then you have windings around these. Okay. Now, if this winding is going kind of like in this direction, it's gonna be different if it was in the other direction, so. Let's say the first winding is still the same. And now if I change this one to, let's see how would that work out. Um, that's this way. This 
So two different directions in this case. Um, if the directions, like for example here, if they match, then you say, okay, dot, dot. So because basically, think of it this way. If you feed a current through here, actually, hold on, before we say that quickly. Um, if you feed your current, use the right-hand rule. This is gonna be the direction of your magnetic field. So you have your B field going in, coming this way, and that. So if your I2 was to support this magnetic field, its direction should be this way as well. All right, so your I2 is going this way. Whereas here, if your I1 is like this, still your direction is this way. However, to support this, once again, you can't feed a current through this wire because if you do that, your eye is gonna come here, 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 here. Right hand rule, your B is gonna be opposing that. So your eye has to flow in this direction. So you're gonna see the difference between the two, right? Okay. So where do you place the dots? Where do you place the dots? Um, well, let's look at the diagram and see. So if my I1 is going in this way, and my I2 is flowing this way, kind of like this example, the dots are gonna be this. Whereas here, if I1 is flowing in, and I2 is also flowing in, then my dots are gonna be the opposite. Does that make sense? Basically, the, this symbol is the, it, it is a symbol for this setup. Okay. Now let's make our mixer. So the, there are many types of mixers out there. The type that we are gonna learn about, and it's actually a decent mixer, it works pretty well, is the diode ring mixer. So let's see how it works. I know it looks scary, but um, you will see it's not that bad. Um, so if you look at this and compare it to the diagram that we drew earlier, we have, like, for example, IF, then LO, and then at the output we had RF. So that's what the setup is. Now, we said that LO has to be kind of similar to a square wave, right? And it's hard to generate a square wave in hardware. 
However, we can approximate it. Um, you guys, first of all, does anyone know what LO stands for? Local oscillator. That's right. That's exactly the same oscillator that you guys built in your um, assignment to, or are going to build. If you haven't done that. <laughs> but yes, this is basically your oscillator, which is oscillating at a relatively high frequency compared to your IF. All right, and the whole point is to multiply these two signals together. Now, if I have like one volt here and negative one volt here, as it was discussed in the assignments, and my diodes can be turned on at let's say 0 0.7 volts, and I chop this off, It kind of looks like a square wave compared to this signal. So, let's see. Down, up, down, up. So we can make this approximation simply because the frequency of this is much higher than this one. <coughs> All right, um, let's see what happens when the LO is at, for example, positive one volt. Doesn't have to be one volt, it can be positive 0 0.7 volts as well. For now. If my LO is at plus one volt, I still have my first coil. Actually, I'm gonna run out of space. Um, no, I can put it here. And then coil. <coughs> okay, so now let's walk through this together. Um, if this is positive one volt, and the dots are here and here, Forget about this one. What is going to be the voltage at this point? What does it look like in that diagram over there? Is this voltage going to be positive or negative? Positive. It's going to be positive, right? So, and if the number of turns are the same, meaning N1 and N2 are equal, I'll get positive one volt here as well. So far so good? Okay, now what is this connected to? This is connected to the ring and then goes back here. Now, let's ignore this one. What is the voltage at this point? Positive or negative? What is it? Negative one, that's right. Because what, what it says is that the voltage across, basically if I put my positive probe here and negative probe here, I should read one volt. So if this is zero, this has to be negative one volt. All right, now if I have positive one volt here and negative one volt here, is it gonna turn on this diode or this diode? It's only going to turn on the left side, right? I don't know what happened to this one. That was the capital. Uh, uh, so yes, these are not going to be turned on because you have a higher voltage at their cathodes than their anodes. So you can completely ignore this part and say only these two are activated. Okay. If this voltage is one volt and this voltage is negative one volt, and this is a very symmetric setup, what do you think is the voltage here? Zero. Zero volts, that's right. So you basically created a virtual ground. All right. Now, what does this go to? This goes to the coil, this coil, and then you have your IF. 
Do I have to care about this part? No, because it's connected to something that's just off. It's out of the circuit. So I don't worry about that. And then I have my RF coming out. OK, so we said that here we basically have 0 volts. So what does that tell us? RF is equal to IF, right? Because the dots match. So my RF in this case equals IF. So that was for the case where LO was positive 1 volts. Any questions about this one? Does it make sense? All right, now let's let's focus on the second um, half cycle. I have negative one volts at the elbow this time. Um, okay, what is going to be the voltage here? Positive, negative? What you will read if you put your probes here, you have to read negative one because it has to be the same voltage as this. So negative one volt here, and the voltage here, positive one. Okay, now again, negative one and positive one are going into the ring mixer. So back to here, if now this part is negative one, this is positive one, which diodes are activated, which ones are not going to activate? The right side, exactly. Um, <clears throat> and what do I have here? Zero. Zero. Okay. And then this goes into this part. So I have another coil, and then I have my other. And once again, I don't care about the rest of it. So. And um, down here. OK, now I have this. Um, What's going to be RF? What's going to be the relationship between RF and IF? Inverse. 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 That's right. Um, so my RF in this case is negative IF. So my LO is negative 1 volts. So far, so good? OK. Um, can you explain that about the resistance, why, why the bottom inductor uh, does not matter in this case? Okay, so if you look at this picture, we said this part of the circuit is completely out. Mm -hmm. So you basically have an inductor connected to nothing. Oh, I see. Yeah, so. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, so what does this tell us? Um, Basically, what I'm doing here is that I have my IF voltage from here. And my LO, let me see if I can use a different color, is chopping this IF very fast.
So when my LO is 1, um, I'm basically, my RF graph looks the same as my IF. So here I have this, but then LO becomes negative, so this part is now going to go down. this and then again positive and then negative so now this part's gonna be like this and then going up. So your output kind of looks like that. It's going to be chopped off. Um, you'll see exactly how it looks like in your assignment three. Um, but basically what's happening here is that now you have a component of the sum of these two, the um, LO frequency and the IF frequency and the subtraction of the two. So feel free to make this circuit and uh, play with it in LT spice. Um, and then if you run FFT, you will see those two spikes. That. So one spike is gonna be at omega LO plus omega IF, and then the other one is gonna be at omega LO minus omega IF. Yeah. And then the other frequencies we talked about, so as we talked about, there's gonna be um, the main harmonics, right? So you have, in the square wave, it's gonna be, um, you have your main frequency, then it has multiple odd numbers. So one, three, one omega, three omega, right? So this would be your first omega, omega LL. Then for the three omega LL, that frequency, that's how you shift it down here, that's going to be much smaller in magnitude, so it's less important, which is why you're going to see mainly peaks over here. Does that also kind of make sense? Yeah. And can you guys also see how this is a result of multiplying a sine wave and a square wave? Like, it looks very weird, but the fact that this results in a spectrum like this, I think it's quite interesting. The square rate that we put in at like amplitude one point five or something. Mm -hmm. Like still by multiplying the one volt square wave. Yes, yes. Um, you don't really have a upper bound for your um, for your LO voltage. You do have a lower bound though, because you want to make sure that these diodes are um, going to be conducting. So if, for example, this ends up being 0.5 volts. Um, you're not gonna be um, you're not gonna forward bias this diode, so your circuit is not gonna work. That's actually one of the downsides to the diode ring mixer. Um, your LO voltage has to be relatively high compared to the other types of mixers, which we are gonna briefly mention right after this. Any other questions? All right. <laughs> Let's see, okay, so we, we went over diode ring mixer. It's useful to know, like just have an idea of what other types of mixers are out there, though you're not gonna be making them, because I, as I said, diode mixer is a pretty good mixer. Though when we get to the R&D phase during winter, the group that's gonna be working on the mixers, they, they are free to explore other types of mixers. There are many options. Um, so. Let's see, what are the other types? So the first type is called, oh, okay, before we actually get to that. 
let's let's talk about some terminologies so that we don't confuse you. Okay. So when we are comparing two mixers, there are certain properties that we use to say which mixer is better than the other one. Um, the first one is conversion loss. Or it could be gain as well. So think of it this way. If you have your RF, LO, and then IF. By the way, okay, you can always switch these two. So here, what I have kind of looks like this. I have my LO, and then I have my IF, and I'm getting an RF out. So when you have this combination, what you're basically doing is you're down converting your signal. So let's say your IF frequency, for example, is 27 megahertz. Your LO is 22, yeah. And then your RF that you expect is going to be 5 megahertz. So that's what we mean by down conversion. Similarly, if you have now RF and then IF. So this time you're actually inputting the signal through this port and you're using this port as the output. In this case, you're going to have an off conversion. So your RF, let's say, is 1 megahertz. Your LO is four megahertz, and then your IF is gonna be 500 hertz. Does that make sense? So, um, you don't really, it's not a strict rule to have this as your output. In fact, you should expect to switch them, as you will see later. Okay, so in this case, it happens that we have an up conversion because our input is connected to the RF port. Um, now, what the conversion loss or gain means is basically how much power I'm getting at the IF port divided by the power at the RF input. And we usually exp express that in dB. Okay, so if the power at IF is larger than the power at RF, I'm gonna have a gain and then if IF is smaller than RF, I'm gonna have a loss. So that's one factor. The other factor is <coughs> LO <coughs> isolation. Again, expressed in dB. So what this means is that I'm putting some power through the LO port. Not all the mix. I mean, mixers are not ideal. You're gonna have some of this frequency leaking into this port, and you can measure the power of it. So if you measure the power that's leaking, and then you divide it by the power of LO, that will give you basically the isolation. Now, if this amount is like about negative 40 dB, um, that's considered a very good isolation in general. So if you measure it in your LT spice and you see that the peak, so let's say your IF, this is basically, these are the two main frequencies that you're interested in, but then you have this LO frequency leaking. Um, so as long as this peak is lower by negative 40 dBs, that's considered really good. Um, this one is omega LO, omega LO plus omega RF. Omega LO minus omega RF. I like that. And then, well, a similar property is going to be RF isolation. 
again in DBs. Um, can anyone guess what this one is? <coughs> It's basically the same thing. Like instead of analyzing the power through LO, you're, uh, you're analyzing the power of RF that's leading into IF. So you will have, for example, your omega RF leak in here, and then again, you're measuring this. Again, if as long as this is, for example, minus 40 dB. Okay, 40 dB is like a really good isolation. If you don't get negative 40 dB, don't worry. Um, And then the last thing that we actually briefly mentioned is the LO drive level. So this basically, this parameter, which is um, kind of expressed in dBm, so decibel compared to milliwatts, um, millivolts, um, this one is basically the amount of LO power that um, you need to feed to this mixer in order to get your IF. We kind of brushed upon it. Um, somebody asked if, um, can the LO be larger? And we said, yes, that's totally fine. But your LO cannot be smaller than a certain voltage. Um, and well, higher voltage amplitude corresponds to higher power. So you have a minimum power to give to your mixer through your LO. And that's basically what this means. And the last parameter is noise figure, <coughs> which is again in dB. So what does this mean? Um, when you're feeding your signal through the RF port, let's say your RF signal kind of looks like this. So it's still your sinusoid, but it's got a little bit of noise on top of it. Signal to noise ratio is basically the power of your signal divided by the power of your noise. So now, if you look at your IF, which is gonna be at a higher frequency, and you do the same analysis, you measure noise power, divide by um, signal power, and that ratio is now larger, you have increased your um, noise. So your noise figure is basically going to be, um, well, here by the definition, noise figure is the reduction of signal to noise ratio from input to output. So as long as you're reducing your <coughs> signal to noise ratio, you have a good mixer. You don't want to increase it, but that's a very hard thing to do. Usually your noise increases. All right, so that was a little bit of terminology. Um, now let's just quickly go over different types of mixers. So what are they? Um, the first one is called unbalanced. Basically the idea behind the mixer is that as long as you have a nonlinear element, you can mix two signals. So the mixer that we discussed had actually four nonlinear elements, which were the four diodes in our ring. Um, however, I can totally make a mixer with one diode. By the way, this is just for your own general knowledge. If someone asks you in a job interview, oh, what's what's the advantage of um, diode ring mixer over an unbalanced mixer like this? So you will have an idea of what an unbalanced mixer is. Um, this is gonna be your DIF. 
Um, so that's one way to build a mixer. It still mixes the signal. How does it do that? Basically, once again, you have your LO, which is also again. And then at your IF, so this diode is only going to be conducting when your LO times, I should have said times with RF, but you get the idea. So basically only when you're at the positive side. So that's an unbalanced mixer. Um, it's the problem with it is that <coughs> when you look at the frequency response of the VIF, you will see both of these frequencies, VLO and uh, omega LO and omega RF in your spectrum, kind of like the spectrum that we drew over there. So both of the, these two frequencies will be present. Um, so that's the disadvantage of unbalanced mixers. Another type of mixer is called single balance mixer. For a single balance mixer, um, it's a little bit complicated, but basically what you have is you have your two signals, your LO, your RF being fed to this block, which is called a four force hybrid. So what this junction is basically doing is, this is a device um, that if you put a signal through A and a signal through B, you would get A minus B and A plus B out of it. Now, you don't necessarily have to put your signals through these two, you can put your LO and RF through A minus B and A plus B and get some A and B out of it too. If you're interested in knowing how this kind of devices are made. Um, for example, in microwave circuits, there is this thing called, uh, what is the name? Uh, oh, yes, it's called the ratchets, which kind of looks like this. And then let's say the frequency of your operation, well, the wavelength of the wave you're sending to this is lambda, and these are gonna be lambda over four. And this is going to be three lambda over four. And I forgot exactly which ones are going to be additions, which one is going to be uh, subtraction. But yeah, one of them is going to be A, the other one is B. You have plus and minus signal coming out. Again, this is this is not the level at which we are operating at. Um, if you're interested in that kind of stuff, that's one sixty three A. If you want to take it. Uh, lambda over 4 is addition and a stream of lambda over 4 is subtraction. It's like an antenna. Which one? A stream of lambda over 4 is the addition and stream of lambda over 4 is the subtraction, I think. But this one is subtraction? Um, or 3 lambda over 4? Wait, no. Maybe, I think B is this one. Hold on, hold on. I, can, I can pull it up. Yeah, so it's a very common element. Four. Okay, uh, let's see. How did we do? Uh, so A is A. Uh -huh. um, this is A minus B. Yeah. Yeah, and then this is April. Yeah, that's, that's, right, that's okay. good. All right. Don't worry about it. So. <laughs> okay. Yes, and then at the outputs you connect it to something like this. Um, that, that will give you a single balance mixer. Now the problem with that mixer would be um, 
In that case, you will have one of these leaking in. Um, so you either have your LO or your RF, depending on whether your LO is on the top or the bottom. Just keep that in mind. So that's another disadvantage with um, single balance. Though these two both have, a, have one advantage over what's called double balance mixer. And that's that their LO drive level is, it doesn't have to be too high. You can drive them with a much lower uh, local oscillator. And then last one, which is double balanced mixer, uh, is basically what we studied. Um, like a diode ring mixer is considered a, a double balanced mixer. And uh, it both gives you LO and RF isolation. So you're not gonna see those two once you build your um, diode ring mixer. Any questions about mixers in general? Does it make sense? Okay, yeah, that's that's all about the mixers. Let's see. Let's let's take a quick break, I would say, yeah. and then yeah, um, we'll come back with filters. Yeah, for a second. Okay. Can I release my hand? Yeah. You know, I, I should just sit next to you. Oh my gosh, I wonder you're holding it. Turn the lights down a little bit. Yeah. All right. All right. Okay. So, a big part of uh, what you guys are going to be doing is putting filters in your designs. As you saw with the mixers, um, you want to focus on certain parts of the frequency spectrum. So, for example, when you want to add frequencies together, you're going to get a whole spectrum of frequencies, and you must want to narrow in on the one of interest. And so, to do that, we're going to use filters. And so filter design is actually a very complicated thing um, and is very tedious by hand. Um, and so thankfully, people have made some nifty calculators to help you do it. Um, we've linked this on the, on the assignment. Uh, this is one website you can use to generate filters. And it has a bunch of great parameters, which you will tinker with and play around with. Um, um, should we first start with the low pass? And that will be easier for this one. Sure. Right. So, one the first filter that, that you could use is a low pass filter. Um, a low pass really just it's, it has a pass band or a place which lets the signal pass if it's below some frequency, and after that it begins to attenuate. So if you can look on this graph it has, this, this site generates for you, it's blue line through magnitude, and as you, can you scroll down a little bit, Martin? As you approach uh, 100 megahertz, I think, that's gonna be your cutoff frequency, meaning the frequency at which you, your signal is attenuated by half, or three dB. Um, it's gonna be, it looks kind of yeah. yeah, and it just goes down from there, and so, this, in conjunction with, with the high pass filter, which we'll talk about next, can be used to also create a um, band pass filter, um, which we will be using. Which we will be using, but you also just create a band pass filter. Yeah, also up to you. Yeah, so that this is one design that you are seeing here. Um, so let's let's see what these parameters mean one by one. So Butterworth is a topology. Um, Order three basically refers to the number of reactive elements in your filter. So as you can see here, you have the capacitor, inductor, and another capacitor, so three reactive elements. As Nathan mentioned, there is a cutoff frequency for low pass filters, which is basically this frequency. Um, and uh, input impedance, output impedance, you're already familiar with those. Um, now, the, the tool gives you an option. You can choose standard or exact. Um, what's the difference between those two? So if you choose exact, it's gonna do everything theoretically. So the numbers that you will get will be 
I don't know, like 33.56 picograms or some, some odd numbers, which we can't actually go and buy from any vendors. So we recommend you design your filters with the standard um, values. And uh, yeah, this is for the low pass. Let's go to the next filter. Oh, by the way, um, what is one bad thing about this? I mean, it kind of looks like it's rejecting um, the frequencies, but why do we want? Why would we want to make this better? What is one thing that would improve this filter? Dominic? Well, it's kind of hard to see from the graph, but like a sharper cutoff, like of, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. So right now, um, if you take an EC one ten, we will discuss this. Um, the slope of this line is minus 20 dBs per decade, um, which is, well, it rejects high frequencies, but not as sharp as we want. So um, if your frequency is still around your cutoff frequency, you will see that in your output signal. Um, that's why we go to other topologies. But the Butterworth, the Butterworth filter makes sense because if you have a DC uh, voltage, What's gonna happen? So inductor is gonna be fully conductive and you will see the voltage here. But if your voltage goes, if your frequency goes higher, um, this inductor is gonna uh, resist and this capacitor is gonna act as a short. So you will lose your voltage and you're not gonna see anything. So that's what intuitively explains what's going on in this filter. Now, if we want to design a high pass filter, Let's see. Change this to high pass. All right. What do you guys think? Does it make sense why? What, what happened in the filter? If you have a low pass, or if you have a less low frequency, that inductor is going to like charge up and then basically bring you down closer. Yeah, that's right. Um, so yeah, that's exactly as you said. So if um, you have DC, your inductor is gonna act as a short and your capacitor is not gonna let the signal travel. But if you have high frequencies, inductor is high impedance, capacitor is low impedance. So you will see the signal on the output. Okay, so what should we do next? Band pass. Okay. Right. I don't think we need to do band stop. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Let's see. Um, yeah, this is this is a band pass filter. Oh, um, so if you look at this, it's kind of like a combination of the two, as Nathan said. So you have series inductor, series capacitor, and uh, also shunt inductors, shunt capacitors. But um, basically. Um, Let's see. You have a capacitor and an inductor, well, here in series. Um, what's going to happen in that case? What's going to happen if you have a DC um, voltage? Would it travel? Would it make it to the other end? That'll be high impedance at DC. So, no. Why is it a high impedance? Because uh, the capacitor. That's right. So all these these two capacitors are gonna give you a high impedance. Um, also, there is this kind of capacitor and um, inductor in um, in series, uh, in parallel. Um, if I have a capacitor and an inductor in parallel, and I have DC voltage, what is gonna be the input the impedance of that combination? No. What is that? Low. Yes, that's right, because the inductor will be conducting. What if it's a very high frequency? Low. It's still low, yes. So, because now the capacitor will be inducting. Um, yeah. What's going to happen at the resonant frequency? Let's, let's first look at um, the, this part, the series. 
So you have a capacitor, you have an inductor in series. If the input both, if the input signal has is at the resonant frequency, what did we say about um, the impedance of that combination? What is that? It's maximized. The impedance. Well, why would it be maximized though? Well, because I assume that high at a high frequency and low low frequency as well, and at the and not at the resonant frequency will be maximized. I don't I don't actually know why. Wait, hold on. You, you said it the other way. Like I I feel like you're talking about this part. This is the series. Um, if you remember, when we designed our oscillator, we had an inductor and a capacitor in series. And we said at the resonant frequency, the impedance of those two cancel each other. So that's why you get a very good, iso uh, a very good um, oscillation. So if, if, if my signal is at the resonant frequency, this is just going to act as a short. But now, what is this going to do? I guess it's very high frequency in infinity. So my signal comes here, it's a short, wants to go down, but it is a very high impedance, so it doesn't go down. And then again, another capacitor and inductor. So it just goes through. So that's what's happening here basically. So when you are at this middle range around the resonant frequency, your signal is completely traveling all the way to the output, but then as you get closer to the higher and the lower frequencies, your gain drops. Yeah. And so usually when you do some filter design, um, it, the higher frequency you operate at, the harder it is to have a tight band pass filter. So this is actually part of the reason why we actually put everything together. Um, we're gonna have two, two stages to step up our frequency. One stage from one to five megahertz and five to 27 megahertz. And the reason we do that is because this makes filter design much easier. Um, you cannot filter out um, like one megahertz or like noise, like noise that's one megahertz off at 27 megahertz as easily as you can from um, when you're operating at five megahertz. So that's why. Um, so it's important to keep to note that. Another thing to note is that when we design these filters, we're gonna have some variation in our filters, some shifting in our frequency, um, shifting of our filters. And so ideally, we want our bandpass region to be flat. So as you go through your assignments, play around with these parameters. Play around with um, your cutoff and upper, the lower and upper cutoff frequencies, your order, your type of filter. Yeah, the type matters a lot. Yeah. Um, let's actually look at look at the low pass filter, but not bother with this time. So a very interesting um, low pass filter is actually Chebyshev. So let's look at what this has for us. Um, okay. So Chebyshev uh, filter, third order, kind of looks like this, but. The good thing about this filter is actually um, uh, this slope is now steeper than minus 20 dBs per decade. Um, that's actually, I think it's negative 40 dBs per decade. Um, however, was it like higher? Hold on. Okay, yeah. So as I increase the order of the filter, you see this curve getting steeper and steeper. So that's the kind of the trade-off. You can use more elements and uh, make your filter more selective. And keep in mind, the higher order you make your filter, the more parts you need to solder. So yeah, don't go insanely high. That'll, that'll be, miss the burden on yourself later on. Like order of five is a good order. Yeah. And also it's not a good practice to go like um, at even orders, like four or two, um, simply because um, you want your filter to be symmetric. So right now, if you look at this, you have a nice cap, inductor, cap, inductor, cap. Uh, so it doesn't matter if I connect my voltage source to this side or I have another voltage source connected to this side. 
my filter will still work. Um, so just it's a matter of symmetry. So try to our suggestion is using a fifth order filter for your designs, especially consider Chebyshev and Butterworth. Those are the two types that you want to look into. And um, as we discussed in our uh, frequency, uh, uh, in our mixer discussion, um, we want to select omega LO plus omega RF, um, nothing else. So you, you will be usually building what type of filter? Any, anyone? What type of filter are we gonna have in our design? If you were to predict. Bandpass? Bandpass, yes. Um, so what you wanna look into, for example, is a bandpass Chebyshev frequency. Um, so we are transmitting at a frequency of 27 megahertz, which means at some point you have to select that 27 megahertz and make sure it's pure. Um, so let's say the lower cutoff is 26, upper cutoff is 28. And uh, okay, here's another factor to consider when you're talking about Chebyshev. Um, yes, Chebyshev filter has a steeper slope. However, um, it will have some ripple in its um, baseband. So if, if I were to stick with the low pass, let's um, increase this pass band ripple um, to, for example, 25. Okay, so you see like it's starting to ripple a little bit. Um, can I make it one? All right, even more. Uh, let's try three. Yeah, so you see, see the ripple. Now, that's the trade-off again. The more ripple you have, the steeper your slope is gonna be. Um, it's up to you. Generally, like, you don't wanna have too much ripple because as Nathan mentioned, uh, we would like to keep our frequencies in the past and pretty at the same level. Um, Okay, so let's go back to this. Um, Bandpass Chebyshev, fifth order, 26 to 28. Let's see what it looks like. Okay, it's a very nice bandpass filter. Now, there is another option, which is the topology. Um, right now, we have set it as conventional series first, but let's, we can play around with these as well. So what's gonna happen is now this paradigm kind of changed. So before that we had a cap and an inductor and then another capacitor, but now we have a capacitor and then a shunt capacitor and so on. So it kind of changes that. Um, let's go back just to compare. Yeah. And it also requires, well, this one is nice because it requires less elements as well. So, so yeah, let's play around. Yeah, you, you've got this tool. Um, like we said, it's gonna be, you will have the link as well. Um, so once you design your filters, feel free to play around. And then once you're satisfied with the filter, put it in your simulation, test it. If you think your filter is not sharp enough, you're not rejecting enough frequencies, then go back to the tool. I don't know, make it higher order, make the ripple larger, um, so yeah. Any questions? Cool. All right. Thank you, guys. That's a wrap. That's a wrap.